Sorry. <laughs> okay, we are live. Hi there. Uh, welcome back to our second Faith of Marketing Masterclass. Today we are here at University College London or UCL. Say hi, everybody. You can't uh, see them, but you can hear them. Hi. <laughs> They're really enthusiastic, I can tell. Um, so yesterday we were at the University of Greenwich, and uh, you heard from Tom Mejia, who was talking about Creative Engineering 101. If you missed that lecture, you can still go check that out on our Twitch channel. It'll be there, and we're also going to re-air the lectures at a later point. So if you missed it, don't worry, we will come back to them. So today, like I said, we're here at UCL in the heart of London, and thanks very much to UCL and to the University um, of uh, Greenwich as well. So uh, a little bit about Faith Aid Smart City. Basically, this is a program which was launched, and it's going to house all of our projects that will take off in the three-week space. And the master classes are the first of these projects. We really wanted to uh, build relationships with educational institutions and with their student bodies and try to support and, you know, if we can, inspire the future leaders of our industry. So that is the goal of all of this. And today, you're going to hear from uh, Andrew London, who's standing by, who's going to talk to you about designing for competition. At Greenwich, we're focusing more on you know, sort of game design and game development, whereas here at UCL, we're focusing more on competitive play. And uh, after his talk, there will be time for Q&A, so you guys can hold your questions until the end. There will be time for that for sure. And of course, if you guys are watching as well, there are some mods sitting in chat right now getting ready to take your questions. So throughout the lecture, if you have questions, just throw them into chat, and they will uh, write them down and pass them on to me. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Andrew for now. And uh, yeah, give him a big warm welcome. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Andrew London, and I'm presenting. So whenever I'm in your position and someone's presenting to me, I always wonder what gives this person the right to stand up there and talk to me. So whenever I present, I kind of like to give a little bit of explanation about why I'm here. Uh, so who am I? I am the director of live operations at Space Hype Games. So right now, my main responsibility as the director of live operations is to make sure that all the games that we run have live things happening. So events and promotions and things like that. But I'm also part of what we call the product team at Space Ape. So the product team at Space Ape includes live ops, uh, designers, product managers, and product owners. And we collectively kind of decide what direction will the game take, what features should we make, how should we balance the economy, how should we market the game, and a lot of decisions like that. So luckily I get to do a lot more than just events, but that is my specialty. So before Space Ape, I worked at a couple other companies. Um, I've been working in live ops for about seven years now, so that's why I know stuff. Uh, I've worked in multiple places, so I'm from California, and I worked in Berlin for two and a half years, and I also did some time in Beijing, and now I'm here in London, so I've gotten to work with a really diverse group of developers, especially across different countries with different development styles. And at Space Ape, I've worked on two different games specifically, Rival Kingdoms and Transformers, but before that, I've worked on I worked at publishing companies, so I worked on a bunch of other different games, uh, about six directly and about 14 indirectly with you know, colleagues and partners. So that was my kind of business credentials, and I'll do a little bit of street cred, um, because I'm talking about competition, I'm talking about esports. So I've been playing competitive games for a long time. I think it started with Brood War. Um, Lurkers are my favorite. Uh, but those single player strategy games were super stressful. So I went to MMOs for a while. So I played Final Fantasy XI, World of Warcraft. This is uh, the best I ever did in World of Warcraft world rankings with my guild back in 2008, making me feel super old now. Uh, then I played StarCraft II when it came out, and that's kind of when I got really into the esports. I watched a bit of StarCraft Brood War before that with like Gaedong and those guys playing in South Korea. But with StarCraft II, it felt like it's new, it's interesting, and Blizzard was trying to promote it. So I actually spent a lot of time, if, we, uh, if anyone's ever watched this, staying up until 3 or 4 in the morning to watch South Korean esports on Gong TV and getting constantly shown Girls' Generations videos and having the GGG song stuck in my head all the time. So that's kind of my esports bit of competition background there so that you trust me a little more. So we're going to talk about a couple things today. Uh, the first section is going to be about designing for competition. We're going to talk a bit about understanding the game, scarcity as a driver, uh, place to play, and community. And then after that, we'll do an example where we kind of look at something that I might do with Space Ape, walk through the steps that I've talked through here, and just give a real life example. And then the final slide will be some of the things that I think you should learn or practice if you want to get into a similar role. So designing for competition. 
there will be gifts, sorry. Uh, so no presentation is complete without a generic corporate graphic. So one of the things I want to start to discuss or get lay out there before we discuss competition too much is that competition isn't singular. There isn't one thing about a game that makes that game competitive. It's usually a lot of different elements. There's one thing that makes the game mostly competitive, but there's a whole bunch more to it. So in this example, we have two players. One player is driven by mastery. So like a StarCraft player might be driven by being able to control all the units perfectly. And the other player is driven by prizes and their opponents. So they really just want to beat the other guys. So in this example, it <laughs> my Parks and Rec example is player one is driven by their opponent. And they really don't like player two. And so they're driven more to compete, and they win. So the important thing to remember is that competition is the sum of all the competitive elements of a game, and not just one thing. So remember that. So how do we get people to compete? In my experience, people generally are competitive. They want to compete anyways. If you don't give them somewhere to compete, they're going to find a way to compete. So the, what you need to identify is how competitive are your players, and how can you do it in a fun and meaningful way? And by meaningful, I mean you, have, as a game developer, have objectives. You want the players to fulfill certain goals so they can experience the game the way you designed it, but also meaningful to the players because if you ever make a game, you're going to realize that the way players experience it is always going to be different from the way you design it. So we're going to talk about understanding, scarcity of resources, developer-supported competition, and the community, all really important aspects of competition. So every game is a unique little snowflake. Uh, this is really important, especially once you enter the actual career aspect. You're going to meet a lot of managers, executive directors, and you might talk to them and they just think every game's the same. You can tell them what's special about your game, what's this, what's that, and they're going to be like, oh, that's just a MOBA, or that's just a strategy game. But if you play games, if you make games, you know that there's 100 little details that make every game unique. And so the first part of making a game competitive is actually understanding the game and how it works and why it is special. So I'm just going to walk through some examples that I myself have experienced. So I played Final Fantasy XI for about four years and World of Warcraft for about five and a half. And I was in high-end rating alliances in both of them. So Final Fantasy XI had a really interesting culture. The game was released in Japan first. So when all of us in the West got the game, they had already established a very Japanese game culture. So everything was very polite and very organized and very orderly. And for a good example is if a monster spawned and your guild didn't claim it, everyone left, stood outside, random numbers, and whoever got the highest number got to fight the monster next to the first group lost. And that was super organized, and that was all driven by the community. Whereas World of Warcraft, if you missed claiming the monster, all the people who didn't get it would stand on top of your character so they, you can't see what your character was doing. So you get the idea that if you very different dynamics, uh, WoW always had the running joke of don't stand in the fire. Even in a raiding guild, we still have that experience of you know, don't stand in the fire that kills you. So it's very different games. But if you were talking to someone who wasn't a real gamer, and you were explaining both of these games, you could say, oh, they're both open worlds. You run around with a single character. You fight monsters in a party to level up. And you get stronger and take parties to go fight stronger monsters. So both of them, in a short description, would sound very similar. But in reality, they're very, very different games. And understanding those subtle differences is what would let you make them competitive. Uh, another example is StarCraft II versus Dota II. I'm a big Dota II player, so there's no League of Legends stuff in here. Sorry. Um, so when I started playing StarCraft II, it carried over from the Brood War tradition of basically Liquid.net. If you don't know who Team Liquid is, they're huge esports. They're super cool. They're kind of grassroots. And back in the day, Team Liquid's website, Liquid.net, is all about the forum. That's basically where the Western StarCraft community existed. They were all about contribution, really like advocated discussion, and they just despised trolling. Anyone who trolled, you just get banned from the forums for not contributing. So they were all about building up the community. Whereas Dota 2, a lot of the players tend to emulate their favorite professional players. And some of those professional players have some really bad habits. A lot of swearing, a lot of not thinking through what they're saying or doing. And so sometimes you, just, you end up with these players who are behaving like professional players, but they're not. 
because they're not good enough to behave that way. <laughs> so, but if you describe both of these games, you could describe them as top-down st strategy type games where you control a character or multiple characters, level them up, equip them, and destroy the enemy's bases. But the de devil's in the details. So if we want to look at how to motivate people to compete, we have to look at scarcity. So basically, everything in life is scarcity driven. I, I've challenged people in the past to tell me one thing that isn't scarcity driven. You can always find something that's scarce to, that motivates people for something. So for example, in real life, there's only so much money, there's only so much time, there's only so much shelter and food, and we're all fighting to get some of it. In the games that I played, in World of Warcraft, everyone wanted to be server first on a raid boss. But if you were server first, then you wanted to be region first. If you were region first, then you would want to be world first. So there was only one of each of those, and that's what drove us to be competitive. In StarCraft II, there's only 1,000 Grand Masters. If you're a Grand Master, you're one in 1,000 in the whole region. And that's something that's very scarce that people want to push for. And with Dota 2, it would be the matchmaking rating. This is basically a number that says how good you are at the game. In reality, I think the scarce resource in Dota 2 is good teammates, but it should be MMR. Uh, so basically, if these things weren't scarce, it wouldn't be very motivating to play these games, because you'd have nothing to aim for, no goal that you're working towards, no motivation. So as game developers, how do we use scarcity to motivate players to compete? That's the real question. So we can encourage competition in our core loops, in our events, in basically every aspect of the game by building some scarcity into our game model. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> so the scarcity can foster competition, but it's, um, if you're too strict with it, you'll just really put your players off. So if I can't get enough of a resource that I need, I'll probably quit the game. If I have too much of it, I'll feel no satisfaction in doing anything with it. So balancing the scarcity is really important. And what's interesting here is, if you're on the right track with your balance, you might actually get negative feedback, but you, that might actually be a good thing. So this is one of those things you kind of only learn through experience. So for example, uh, players give feedback that they want more of everything. Maybe they need more gold, they need more lumber, they need a little bit more of everything. At first you would think, oh, they don't have enough resources, we should give them more so they can play the game. But in reality, this might be perfect. This might be exactly what you need because if they don't want something, then why are they playing the game? So whenever you see this, don't knee jerk and say, oh, we should give them things. Step back and say, do they have just enough to incentivize them to play the game? Another interesting one is uh, when we get contradictory feedback. This is really interesting because one player's experience might not match another player's experience. So a player might write to us in a customer feedback email and say, I didn't get enough energon, for example. And another player might write in and say, I have too much of this. If you get really contradictory feedback, that's actually kind of a sign that you're on the right track to scarcity because players are having different experiences where they have scarcity and surplus at certain different times. Uh, finally, <laughs> players will say one thing and do another. Uh, this happens all the time. A player will say, this thing is too scarce. I, which is, translates to, I want this thing. And they are trying to get us to make it easier so they can get it more easily. And usually we try to resist that urge because if we give something to a player too easily, there's no satisfaction in it. You don't get that self, sense of self-worth. You, you didn't earn anything. You didn't jump through any loops. You didn't show mastery of anything or any skill. So, but we often see players say they want something easier, but then they engage in the design to earn that thing later on. So you always want to be careful that when players say that they want something to be easier, that it makes sense with your design, because sometimes getting things too easily is no fun. Uh, <clears throat> so another thing as developers, we need to give players a place to play. Now, this makes a lot of sense. You have your core loop. There's normally the thing that all the players do all the time. With StarCraft II, it was just the match. Um, but as developers, we want to make sure that we give players a place to compete, a place where we are lowering the barrier of entry on competition. We're saying that you don't need to organize a tournament in line or find a bracket online or organize on a forum. We as developers are presenting you a place to compete that has very low barrier to entry, so you can just 
hop into the game, tap a button, and you're in a competitive area. So this is really important, and it's especially good for um, managing the level of difficulty of events. When you're sponsoring an event as a developer, you can control how difficult it is, how large scale it is, uh, how many people are involved, what people are involved. Some events you don't want everyone competing in because the prizes or the incentives are just no good for high level players. So you might section them out. Uh, you also want to make sure that you have control so that you can have a realistic cadence. One of the things that I as a Dota 2 fan have experienced is they've moved to this major system where every two or three months there's this, a Dota 2 major. And then with the other Dota competitions between that, I feel like there's a, a big tournament every weekend. And at one point, even the players were complaining. They were saying, I can't fly to all these competitions. I can't do this. I'm exhausted. So that they had to start ditching competitions that were less important to them. So as a developer, you want to make sure that you're controlling the cadence of your events and the cadence of your competition. So how often are you running events so that you don't burn your players out? If you ask someone to compete at their maximum level every single day, there's just no way they're going to be able to maintain that. And finally, rewards really need to match the effort. This is one of the things that we're, well, I'd say we're really good at. Um, but it's, it's really uh, an art to make sure that how much effort a player is putting in matches the rewards they get out. One of the nice things about like, games that rely solely on competition, where the, like Dota 2, for example, where it's MMR, that competition drives the rewarding. The reason we play is to get that number higher. So it's that, and that's just determined by the community. So the community always places the value on the rewards. So at Space Ape, we like to do events basically every weekend. We found that, uh, well, we spe specialize in mobile games. So we find that our player demographic mostly play on the weekend. That's when you get the most players. And that's the time that they have the most time to engage with us. So what we've done is we use different types of events to engage with our players in different ways. So if we've made a shiny new piece of content, so if we were playing Transformers, a, a new robot, or if we're playing Rival Kingdoms, a new ancient, we might run an event to distribute this content to our players. We also run events just to engage players. If some players are, you know, they've been around for years, they've been around for months, they've finished some, their immediate objective, and they need something to do. So we'll run an event that is focused on just giving them something to do. It doesn't have to be hardcore competition, but it's about engaging the community. We also like to run events that fulfill demand for resources that we've made scarce. So a good example in Transformers, we have these four-star shards that allow players to get four-star bots. And we put those in almost every event just because they're scarce and players enjoy them and like getting them. And we also like to, we also like to provide a, a venue for showing off. Sometimes players just want to compete and get their name put into a news feed or onto a leaderboard. So one uh, trick of your event cadence is to know when to go big. When do you double down? When do you ask your players to compete really hard? And this cadence varies a lot depending on games. Uh, our games, we tend to ask players to go big every four to five weeks because we iterate quite quickly as mobile games. But for Dota 2, for example, they go big once a year. And I mean, 28, $25 million prize pool is pretty big. So when you're looking at your cadence, be sure that you're looking at your events as different levels of competition, but also know when you need to go big because players will want that venue. They'll want to compete. Uh, so community, community is a really tricky one. I'm definitely not going to cover everything you can possibly cover on community, but I'm going to try and cover a few key beats. So community is why I really played MMOs. Uh, if you've talked to anyone who played an MMO, they probably had a group of friends. They probably had two or three buddies that they were always competing with. Uh, personally, for me, the reason I played was uh, that mastery validation point, second to the bottom. I was all about playing with the best players and trying to beat them. Even if they were my friends, I always wanted to beat them. Uh, so a lot of players experience this through their community. So you always need to foster a good community to get all these benefits out of it. Uh, especially if you want to get any, uh, you know, the friends is a big one, uh, advice, support structure, all of that. Uh, but communities are hard. They're really hard. So one of the, the toughest things about communities is when do we listen? to them, and when do we try to, uh, sorry, when do we listen, when to support or when not to support them? Because a lot of the things that they're saying are very valid from a player point of view, 
but sometimes they conflict with our design point of view. So we as developers, we try to have a very, very clear communication channel with our players. Actually, at Space Ape, we do uh, weekly Twitch streams where we just talk directly to our players. We tell them what we're thinking, why we did something. Um, so we try to be very clear and transparent with that. But sometimes, if you're once of the two groups are at odds, you kind of need to make a decision about what to do. So because we get very contradictory feedback, it's almost impossible to make everyone in your community happy. If someone writes in and says, hey, I, I want more of this, and then someone writes in and says, hey, I want less of that, and no matter what you do, someone's going to be unhappy. So you always have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt, what you want to action on, and who you want to make happy. Um, I think the biggest challenge here is not only knowing that you need to take it with a grain of salt, but actually doing it. I've worked with guys who have worked in the industry for ages, and they get the feedback from the players, and they read it, and you can see they either get really happy or really sad, and it's just like, you know, don't, don't let it get to you that much. Like, you know, they're, they're playing the game, they're interested, they love it, but we have to understand that they have a very different point of view from us, and that our goal is to make sure that they have fun. So, uh, for Space Ape, we have quite a few channels to talk to our players. We have, uh, we allow players to write customer support emails, we talk to them on social media, we stream with them once a week on our games. We also have these chat rooms for some of our players where they can talk to us directly. Um, and we actually collate all of that feedback every day into an email that the whole dev team gets and reads every morning. So we always have an idea of what our community is thinking and what are the topics that they're discussing. <laughs> I really like this picture. Uh, so competition, uh, it really only works within a well-designed system. So. One example, uh, a real world example right now is, again, Dota 2, because it's the game I'm playing right now. Uh, they've moved to a process where they're patching the game every two weeks with balance updates. And some of the professional players have just gone on, just, like during the competition, said stop patching the game. Because no one can actually develop a strategy for a game this complex in two weeks. And they feel that the game is changing so often that they, they don't know how to play within that uncertainty. So as developers, or specifically my role as someone who runs events, I like to create a framework of st stability. So one of the things you'll find is if you change things a lot, especially if you are acquiescing, if you are doing exactly what they ask without really thinking about the impact it will have on your design, you might find yourself on a slippery slope. If a player says, hey, we just want 5% more of this currency, and you turn to the team and you say, hey, that sounds reasonable, right? It's just 5%. 5% always leads to 10%. 10% always leads to 25%. So you need to be careful about how you take feedback and how you implement it in your game because you'll find that it's really easy to get on a slippery slope where you'll look back six months and you'll think, how did this happen? How are we in this point where everyone has too much currency? And that kind of leads into sticking to your guns. If you put a lot of time into designing a game, designing a competitive environment, designing the economy, and you have a lot of confidence in that, sometimes you have to stick with it for a while. And those first couple months, are, you're, you're going to really feel like, I just want, I want to change things. The players want this. I should change this. But you really need to kind of step back and say, look, let's let it play out. Let's look at the data. Let's see how the community adapts. Because when you have a new game, for example, the community doesn't know what they are yet. They're just a group of random people who've gotten together behind this game. They need some time to kind of gel behind the game you've created. And so before they can figure out their communal identity, if you start changing things, then they're, they're going to be confused as well as you. So be sure that you stick to your guns if you're confident. But when the players point out something that's really stupid, fix it, obviously. Um, this is my favorite quote uh, for this kind of thing, is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Every game dev I've ever worked with just wants to make a good game. They want to make a good game that's beautiful, it's fun to play, and players love it, and everyone's happy. That's pretty much all of their objectives. Now that's hard because we have scarcity. We only have so many programmers. We only have so much time. And one of the things you have to keep in mind is that when the community asks for something, we really want to give it to them sometimes, but we have to step back and think, is this really what's right for the game? Is this really what's right for the experience? So always be aware of, you know, am I doing the right thing for the game that will make the players happy as well? So the kind of summary of this is to read between the lines. You know, the better your understanding of your game, the more you can do to help make it better. Uh, so here's a, a 
fairly quick practical example of something I might do. So I was recently working on Transformers Earth Wars, and uh, when I joined this game, it was just before the game launched. And so my task was to figure out a lot of our events. And so we were sitting, I sat down, I had just joined the team, I hardly know anything about Transformers, while our product lead is a massive Transformers nerd. He knows all the Transformers, he knows everything about them, and here I am, I know Optimus and Megatron, basically. So I sat down, talked to the team, and we're like, what, what makes this game special? Why, do, why are players engaging in this game? So at that time, it was the 30th anniversary of Transformers Generation 1 movie. And so we, we watched the movie, my product lead told us a story about how we cried during one of the scenes in the movie as a kid. And we're like, all right, all right, you're our target demographic, so why would you play this game? And so we listed out just like a couple basic reasons. We had more, but this is a good summary. Uh, so ours is a, a battling game, so there's that, to engage in the core loop to battle. There's the nostalgia, the game just had a 30 year anniversary. There's the idea of collecting all the bots and you know, being the leader of the Autobots or the Decepticons. And then there's just the bots themselves. And in the end, after we talked to people, we saw players' feedback. It, it was all about the bots. That's, that's all they wanted. They just wanted every toy they had as a kid to be a 3D model in the game. That's what they wanted. So we decided that we would take this and work with it. That's, we would build it into the game. So the team took this idea, this lore from the Transformers universe of a space bridge. And the idea of the space bridge is you can travel between planets in this, with the space bridge. And we said that, OK, so we'll bring bots through the space bridge. And we're going to do this by having these crystals that are attuned to certain bots. And, but you don't always get the, the exact bot you're looking for. And that was our way of making the bots have a scarce economy so that we could add value to the bots. And engaging with them would be really interesting. So next, we created a place to play. This is a simple tournament structure that we built. And the way it works is you go into a special menu that is very clearly marked as an event. It has a timer. It tells you the duration. It has its prizes listed out on the right-hand side. And if you go to battle, you'll earn, um, you'll earn battle points for every battle that you do. As you earn battle points, you'll fill up this bar, and you'll earn prizes. And we run all of our different types of events through this. And so we give the players a place to compete. And finally, how we use this with our community. So when we built the event, the tournament, we built three basic structures. We built an individual version, a guild version, and one with prestiging. And prestiging just means that you can repeat it a number of times. And so by taking those three types and varying the prizes, we've been able to create events that meet different goals. So we have events that are very engaging but relaxed. We have events that are really competitive and intense. And by putting them in different orders and different cadences, we've been able to try and meet the needs of our players by giving them the ultra-competitive players of NU to compete, and the more casual players of NU to engage. And especially, they particularly like the guild events, because anytime you get a group together, it's a lot easier to work towards a goal. Uh, yeah, so that's just a quick example of what I might do as Space Ape. Uh, so here's a bit of a list of what you could do to get better or to learn things if you were interested in this kind of role. So I actually do a lot of things like design and a lot of economy balancing as well as the events. So there's a lot of things in, that we do at Space Ape. We do a lot of T-shaping, we call it, where you learn the skills of other disciplines. So the, the first one for any gaming career is to play games. Just everyone we interview, we ask them, hey, what games do you play? What games did you play? What's your favorite game? Uh, if you want to be a specialist in competition, be sure that you compete yourself. Join some tournaments, find a competitive game, join a team. It's that, that team dynamic is just, it's something really special about being in a competitive team. If you've ever done sports or played in a competitive team in eSport, you'll understand that's important. Uh, this step is actually a bit more fluffy, but you should really understand what kind of competitor you are. I, for example, totally acknowledge the fact that I am a massive elitist when it comes to MMOs. If I can't be in the top guild and I can't be competing for the top rankings, then I'm not going to play at all. And unfortunately, that takes a lot of time, so I don't really play MMOs anymore. But if you don't understand what kind of competitor you are, then you don't know what mindset you're approaching all of this competition with. If you tell someone, no, that's too competitive, how do you know it's too competitive if you don't even know what your baseline is for competition? Uh, the next one is to talk to a diverse group. 
you hear this, you'll see this in the news of, uh, you know, echo chambers, especially in Silicon Valley. They're in trouble for this right now. And you want to avoid that a lot. You don't want to surround yourself with people who are the same as you. If everyone in the room is a hardcore competitor, then you're just going to get hardcore competitive feedback. If you don't have someone who's a more casual competitor or someone who engages in competition for different reasons, then you're just always going to be trying the same things and either succeeding or failing in the same areas. If you really want to get some interesting innovation, you need to bring someone in who has very different views from yourself. Right now I'm working on a project at Space Ape with a guy who calls himself the filthy casual. And it's great because I'm very hardcore and he's a self-admitted filthy casual. And it's really interesting dynamic because I'll say it needs to be more, hard, like more hardcore. And he's like, no, no, it needs to be more casual. And then we compromise and we come up with actually some really unique ideas. Uh, <clears throat> So especially for events, you want to get feedback before, during, and after an event. Uh, before an event, you'll often get a lot of, uh, they'll knee jerk, they'll, make they'll jump to conclusions about what the event is going to be, what the competition is going to be like. And that's really important to know. Never dismiss that. How people perceive something really indicates how they're feeling. It's not just how they feel about the event, it's how they're feeling about everything. And it really indicates whether they're going to engage and support you. If everyone is really negative about something, that's the problem, even if it hasn't happened yet. So you should be noting that very strongly. During the event, you always want to keep your eyes out for any bugs or errors or problems with the community. And then at the end of the event, of course, you want to collect feedback on how the event finally went. After the players actually competed, how do they feel about the event now? And if you have that before and that after, you can kind of look at it and say, was the event a success or was it not? And then you. There will be plenty of events and plenty of competitions that are not a success. That is not something you are trying to avoid. There will be plenty of failures and mistakes. You just need to know when they happen so that you can learn from them. Uh, use data when you can. It's, you don't always have it, but it's really good for validating things. If you can do uh, A-B tests or just look at engagement through your game. So it, it, whenever you're running an event before you run it, before you even design the whole system, you'd want to sit down and go, what metrics are we saying makes this a success? And if you have that, you can compare it over events. At Space Ape, we have player engagement in events since the game's launch. And we look at that graph every week to make sure that the things we're doing are still as good, if not better, than the things we've done in the past. Um, if you want to do something like I do, with a lot of events, a lot of balancing, I use a lot of spreadsheets. I do a lot of math. It's not everyone's thing, but I like it. Uh, also, for anything co competitive, you're going to need to understand matchmaking and ELO and this kind of thing. ELO is like a skill-based scoring system to match players of equal skill. There's better versions of ELO. That's a rabbit hole of its own. It's a really interesting topic if you're into numbers and matchmaking. And then finally, I think anyone who does any speech on gaming should talk about just do it. You know, get your foot in the door, learn some things, learn, make some connections with people, Ask people how they do things. Do it yourself. Organize your own event. Organize your own competition. Engage with the community. Engage with the industry. And that's the most important. Like For example, I'm in this job because I graduated during the recession and couldn't find any job. And my friend was like, do you want to be a game master at a publishing company? And I thought, no, I don't. And I was like, but I don't have a job. So I moved to San Jose and I took a job that was not my ideal job. And seven years later, I have my ideal job. So you know, with, with the game industry, there's a lot of value in doing your time and like showing that you can work hard, showing that you can stuck to your guns, showing that you've learned things and adapted. So if you ever have a moment of self-doubt, just go out and do something. And that is my quick presentation on competition. Any questions? Awesome. Uh, yeah, if you guys mm -hmm. want to just stick up your hand in the audience, then I'll come around and bring you the mic. For the um, benefit of Twitch, so they can view your questions as well. And you guys on Twitch, if you have questions, really just uh, throw them into chat so the mods can uh, grab them. All right, I'm coming around. I'll start over here just because they're closer. Hey, uh, I'm Ollie. I'm very interested in the tooling that enables you to um, deploy these events and what enables you and so what gets in your way. Sure. So uh, at Space Ape, we use a uh, CMS. So we have a large file that has a lot of our settings. And we do two different types of content updates to control events. One is a CMS push, where basically we, make, we change some values. So we might say, 
Uh, just as an example, this is a terrible example, it's just an example. If there was a boss that had 100 health, we could change that value to 150 health and push out the CMS update. Players will then download that file and they'll see the boss with the new health value. So we can change all, all of our values in the game using that. Um, we also have one which is called live config where we build in overrides. So uh, we have a website where we can change some things on the fly in real time and they'll just override the values of the CMS. So those are our two main tools. So uh, for example, to schedule an event, we'll have a template of an event in the CMS and then we'll just override the start and end times and that will trigger the event to start and end at the right time. So, uh, we have two different systems for that. Uh, one thing, we op especially with the mobile development that we do, you have to, we release client updates quite often, but they're very small client updates. So we don't do the every three months there's an expansion kind of updates. Uh, so if there's some new content that requires a client update, you have to make sure that the client update gets out there and that players have installed it before you run the event. So you usually want to check to make sure that like 80 to 85% of your players have downloaded that update before you force them to download it and then run the event. Thanks, and over here. Uh, hi, I'm Matt. Uh, I was just gonna ask about the ELO system stuff because I've heard a lot of things about uh, the ELO system being flawed in team-based scenarios. Um, is there any sort of easy way around that? Has a way of been discovered to fix that problem or is it still <laughs> prevalent? <laughs> Interestingly enough, we were having a discussion about this yesterday. Uh, there's definitely no easy solution, I would say. There's a couple third-party like SDKs that are saying, oh, we've got your matchmaking solution. Um, anytime someone says they can solve all your problems with an SDK, it's probably not true. Um, so we were talking about it. We agreed that the ELO system has flaws for parties. Um, we were looking at some other systems for inspiration, like Glico and the, the True Skill one. Um, but I would say, overall, we don't have a perfect solution. Actually, the more interesting thing about uh, matchmaking is about skill rating is the matchmaking part of it because your skill rating you want to be as you know accurate as possible your elo to be as accurate as possible but if you put people in a party that doesn't make any sense then it doesn't matter what their skill rating is so we had this conversation yesterday and we left saying actually the more important thing is the rules for matchmaking who goes into a party why are they in a party how long do we want them to wait to be go from their party to the battle that kind of thing so I don't think anyone's perfectly cracked that nut, but there's a lot of resources online. Oh, there's a lot of statisticians that do really interesting papers and blog posts on it. Cool, I've got a, a few from Twitch over here. Uh, one is from xliad19. Is learning programming languages a must to be a game designer? No, absolutely not. Um, a lot of our game designers have dabbled in it, like, uh, I do a little bit of programming, but it's terrible. Like, I, I can make a game in like 100 times the time it would take for one of our devs to do it. Um, it helps to understand, but it's not a requirement at all. Um, but I do think having pretty strong math skills is a good requirement. Um, but again, that varies. That, I think if um, Adam Kay, one of our designers, is going to do a talk later on about design in general. And I think what he would say is, you know, it depends on your specialization. If you want to be a designer that specializes in something, you're kind of pigeonholing yourself a bit, but you probably you won't need to learn some of the other skills per se. Um, but I definitely don't think you need programming. Cool. Another question comes from Brains456. <laughs> First of all, uh, they want to know what position do you play in Dota? <laughs> uh, so it, it depends. It usually depends. So I play with another guy at the office and like we alternate between fifth position support and carry depending on if we were losing or winning the previous match. And sometimes we just go, I don't care, I'll, like, I'll random and whatever. But I, I like a core role, so like off laner is my preferred position. And then they go on to say, serious question. <laughs> that is serious. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, what sco scope is there for data scientists in the gaming industry right now? Oh, there's a, oh my gosh. So there is so much demand for data scientists who understand games. I have worked with so many data scientists that don't understand games, and you just have to sit down and explain why I want this weird data and why it will make sense once you pull it. So we're really lucky at Space Aid. We found these data scientists that understand games. So when I go to them, I'm all excited. They get excited too. And it's not some data scientist from a boring banking company who just thought that it was a hip industry to work in. So if you are a data scientist and you understand games, you will be in demand for sure. 
Cool. We have some more uh, from Twitch as well. But do you guys in the audience have another question? I'll come around. All quiet on the Western Front. <laughs> cool. Um, this question comes from Lunatic Muse. How does one study for a career in the gaming industry? How does one study? That's, I mean, if you want to be a programmer or something, then that's an obvious route. Uh, a lot of the other areas, like if you want to be a product manager or a live operations manager or a designer, there are schools that offer that. I don't really know how well those programs translate into careers because I didn't do that route either. I think the, the best thing to do is to study something that's down the, the area you're interested in. So a lot of product managers study business and statistics. Um, that's good for live operations as well. Designers, well, I'm not really sure. That's a good question for Adam Kay in his upcoming speech. Uh, I don't know, I, I found that for me it was less about studying for it and more about making connections and finding people in the industry who I could talk about and we could share knowledge and bounce ideas off of each other and you know, get, make connections to actually get jobs in the companies where we could learn things much faster. Uh, okay, there's a, it's more, <laughs> I just want to say it because I think it will be funny even though it will embarrass you. This comes from Arcanaut Games. <laughs> Andrew always gets these questions. Question for Andrew, <laughs> why is he so cute? Okay, so next. <laughs> Moving I prefer on. the Dota questions. Could you get more <laughs> Dota questions? <laughs> next question. Um, comes from uh, Christopher LBS. If players don't mention that something in a game is off scale, but you see it in the gameplay, do you communicate the fix to the players or just let it ride until they notice? Uh, I would communicate the fix to the players. Um, unless it was something that you could only fix after a certain period of time and it could be exploited. Um, like if there was a, an opportunity that they could exploit a client code and hack the leaderboard. If you can't fix that for seven days, obviously don't tell them about it. But once it's fixed, you should tell them so that they understand. Um, a lot of the times we've had to fix some less savory bugs and usually what we did was we met with our customer support lead um, and we would just sit down and discuss it, like how should we approach this? Where should we tell them? When should we tell them? How should we tell them? Do we need to change anything in the game to make this correct? Um, I think it's really important that you're transparent with your players. If you, players are so smart. They love your game. They just want to play your game. They're going to tear it apart. They're going to analyze it. They're going to understand some of the economy and balancing changes better than you do. So you can't pull the wool over their eyes. You can't fool them. So don't even bother. Just be honest with them and approach them like the mature adults that they are. Cool. Another question from uh, Cyberfear. Um, they said they'd be interested to know if there's any ideas to maximize competition in team-based games without relying on teammates to perform. <laughs> hmm. That's a, that's a really good one. I would love to have that in Dota 2. I have so many stories about bad teammates. Um, it's always the other team, by the way. It's always the other players. It's never me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I haven't really thought about that much myself. I know that uh, some games like Overwatch do a really good job of trying to find something that you did really well in that battle. I think um, uh, oh, other games do this too. They, they try and find something positive to shine a light on that you did, that you excelled at. So if you wanted to make a game where it was a team game but you were trying to excel yourself, you'd probably want to map the progression in that game to one of those areas of personal success. So it might be you healed the most, you gained 100 player experience, that kind of thing. But that's also, that could be a bit mixed and matched because even if you, if you lost the game brutally and then the game comes out and tells you, congratulations, you healed the most, you get 100 experience, you're going to be like, yeah, but I don't really feel like it. Um, so you definitely would want to balance the, the experience with the message that your game is sending your players. So I think a lot of games have tried to tackle that one and you know, I've been playing Dota 2 for years and it's, yeah, that's a hard one. Illuminator wants to know, uh, do people usually start off working in the games industry or do they transition from elsewhere? I've seen a bit of both. Um, I think it, it depends a lot on your position, but actually I've, I've probably seen more transfers than starting in the industry. Um, like developers, like client developers, I think start more in the industry because that's a, that's a pretty specialized skill, you know. 
you know how to use Unity and you're a wizard at making the core loop super fast and just prototyping really quick. Um, if you're you know, marketing or live ops or those things, then it's a bit easier to come in from the outside. Um, if you do come in from the outside, I do have one piece of advice, which is you know, be a bit humble. Like, don't come in from the outside into a games company and be like, I came from a consulting company or a bank or mar digital marketing. I know everything because the gaming industry is really unique to itself. And so you need to be pretty open-minded to learn what the other people have to tell you. And you'll probably learn a bunch. Cool. Yeah, that being said, I think it goes both ways. Sometimes it's great to have outside uh, perspective on games uh, rather than from just people who've always been in the games industry because yeah. it brings in different kinds of perspective, different types of storytelling, um, and can really change up a game as well. So, Next question comes from Zorkify. <laughs> That's my, always my favorite part, reading out the names. What's the balance between roles in Space Ape? Designer, programmers, artists, etc. cetera. Uh, the balance. Uh, I don't know if they mean like number of employees or how we interact with each other, but it's, it's pretty even actually. So I think for, well, we actually have the least PMs right now, but we tend to, within any game team, no one really wields more power than another or should. That's how it's ideal on our team. So if we, on Transformers, for example, we had a designer, a live ops manager, a product owner, and a PM. And what we would do is we were the product team and we would go and have a meeting and discuss and we would discuss until we were all on the same page and we made a decision. And that, that could be a lot harder than it sounds. Or sometimes someone would just say, I understand you guys can do it that way. Um, so in that regard, we're very balanced. We try and respect everyone's thoughts and opinions. I think right now we have probably an equal amount of designers and live ops managers. We have the least amount of PMs at the moment, mostly because PMs become this kind of like floaty, does a little bit of everything type of person, so they change roles quite a bit. And we have you know, probably about this, I think it's pretty even. It's pretty even, actually. Cool, we've got a question from the audience over here. What's your name? Hi, I'm Jess. Um, I wanted to ask, how far can developers actually engineer a culture into a game, and how much is it is down to the player base entirely? Mm. That's, that's a really good question. I don't know if anyone could actually answer that. I think if you tried, if you had so much ego that you thought you could engineer the community culture, you're probably doomed to fail. Um, but I think what you can do is you can look at the, you can design a game for a demographic. So you can say, we're making a game that appeals to a certain demographic of people. And we can validate this by testing it, by just showing them artwork, having them play five minutes of the game. And that will validate that you are making a game for the correct demographic. Now, once they get the game, and it's a few months in, how they gel and behave and mold is, it's, it's kind of like watching a child grow up. You don't really know which way it's going to go. Um, you know, it, it's nice, but it's, it's a challenge. I, I think that you should try to engineer the community that you want, but when it changes, just be ready to change with it. Cool. This question comes from uh, Arcanaut Games, again. Is it possible the player base's overwhelming feedback and the back-end data can tell two different stories? Good question. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is totally possible. So uh, this kind of comes from one of my points where players might say one thing, but they might behave another way. Um, but th actually, that eh, it happens so often, but it's not like the majority of players. Um, but for the most part, what will happen is you'll have a really influential person in the community, and they form an opinion, and everyone says, I, I really like this guy. I will support that opinion. So you might see a groundswell of support for an opinion based on some really influential people in the game. And that might conflict with the data quite harshly, because they are supporting him and they, or her, and they are saying, this is an idea that we support. But they still want to play the game, so they might still continue to behave that way. Uh, I've run into this situation a couple of times. Different games have handled it differently. Um, I think the most important way to handle it is to just open a discussion. Like, take what they're saying seriously, have a discussion with them, see if their concern is, if, is that really the concern or are there underlying issues? And just try and unwrap the problem and discuss it with them. Um, 
Kiari Kid is asking, I'm doing my postgraduate degree in history, but getting a job in the game industry is my dream. Is it possible for someone with my education to get a job in gaming? Of course. I mean, you're doing postgrad work, you're probably pretty smart. There's no reason you couldn't get a, game in, a job in gaming. I think the, the most important thing, though, will be to try and find an opportunity that matches your skill set or understand that your skill set not might match the opportunities in the gaming industry and be willing to learn and adapt. So you might, if you really, if you were super passionate about working in the gaming industry, but you had taken a route of education that just had nothing to do with it, you might find another point of entry in like customer support or quality assurance or live ops, for example. A lot of the live ops guys, including myself, we run events and we start that way and then we learn more and more about the economies and the numbers and the design until eventually people trust you enough to do other things. And that's really the most important part is to get in, earn trust, and when you earn trust, people will give you more things to do. Cool. Uh, another question comes from uh, Xliad19. What did you study before you became, um, a ga well, they say game designer, which isn't exactly what you are, but you do Close some enough. game design. Uh, I studied international business and marketing. So I had a double major which, when I graduated, was completely worthless. And if I could go back and do it again, I would study computer science. Regrets. Um, did any of what you studied help you become, <laughs> 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 help no, you get into the role you're in um, now? I think the reason I, I said it was worthless, because I'm judging myself a lot, but uh, I have, uh, as I mentioned, I've worked in the US, I've worked in Germany, I worked in UK, and I worked in Beijing. And, one of the things that we did a lot of in international business was understanding that everyone is culturally different and how to accept those cultural differences and work with them. And of course, that's the same with your players. They're very culturally different and even the communities are different. So I think it helped me in that way. Also, the marketing helped a little bit because we do a lot of marketing type stuff on events. So we'll have graphics, imagery. We have to write a lot of copy. I've actually written like tons and tons of narrative for Transformers Earth Wars of two bots talking in a ridiculous story in conjunction with a designer. So yeah, a lot of the copywriting came from skills from university. Sorry, we've got time for maybe two more questions and then we're gonna need to wrap. This one comes from And Now We Mad. They say, question. I'm building project coordinator experience to hopefully get my PMP certification. What can I do to develop other skills for the gaming industry? Oh, I, I have to admit, I don't know what PMP is. What does PMP stand for? Anyone know? I don't know either. Do you guys know? <laughs> well, project coordinator, I think the, the most important role there is that if you're going for project coordinator, you're probably aiming for a larger company, probably AAA or some kind of large company that where they, they have enough people on a team that they require more coordination. So the, the skills there that you'd want to have are uh, you know, the managing JIRA, knowing how to use the JIRA ticket system, or you know, getting Scrum certified, or, and learning Agile so that you can you know, really get deep into it and understand and make things nice and organized for your people. But also, when your team tells you they don't like something one way, to be flexible. Because just because they teach you some, one thing in Agile doesn't mean that that's what your team likes. Um, yeah, I, I think also the soft skills. I think that's, that's one of the things that I've seen people learn the most on the job is the soft skills. Like how do I talk to people? How do I talk to people that disagree with me? Like really disagree with me? Uh, that's probably the hardest thing and especially if you're a project manager. If you're trying to say, hey, we need to get this thing done, you have to sell it. And that means you need to have some strong soft skills and how to pitch this and get your team to support you. And this one is coming from uh, Brains456 again. And this is a bit of a broader one about the industry. Um, can you name one thing that sort of happened in the gaming industry last year that maybe shook it up a little bit or was a trend? And then any change or trend you see going forward? Off the top of your head. Well. <laughs> I mean, I'm really focused on like my own little areas, but I think the, the interesting one for me, uh, the one, and I think I talked about this a bit at another talk, was the way PUBG just kind of came out of nowhere and just took the whole game industry by storm and that whole, that whole like, I forgot what it's called, that survival like kind of mechanism where uh, death match for everyone, when you die, you're out kind of thing, that whole mechanism just exploded. And then within, 
well, it's like a few months, Tencent has the game out on mobile. And it was like, wait, this whole phenomenon just happened and you already have it out on mobile. And I think that that kind of, especially for us in the West, like we, we are all really focused on having smaller teams, whereas they have really large teams. And so we approach the gaming industry so different. And even as I've, I've done work in Beijing, it was just really impressive to see that kind of thing happen. And I think that uh, more and more, the East and the West are going to learn from each other and kind of adapt. And yeah, that was the, the one thing that stood out to me last year was the way those PUBG games came out. And Illuminator, sorry, Illuminator was asking about uh, stories in games. Are there any really good stories you've seen last year in games? Stories? Mm. What do they mean by stories? Uh, like a game with good storytelling. A game with good storytelling. Um, mm, I, haven't, I haven't played any for a while. I don't know. Guys in the uh, audience, do you have any? Um, oh, yeah, one second. Coming yeah, well, it's over. a good game with storytelling. Good game with storytelling? Or is it a question? I'm oh, sorry, I was going to ask. This is going to be a different uh, question. Uh, well, we, we can do the storytelling one. Um, so I think like on mobile, there's been a lot of story games coming up with uh, like episodes and choices in those games. And they're telling stories. Um, they're not necessarily the right stories for me. So I don't find them the most interesting. But I, I really like the idea and the concept of telling stories. Um, I think like the last game that I played that I thought had a really compelling story was like Bioshock Infinite. Um, but I don't play too many games lately, unfortunately. So sorry, I don't have a great answer for that. Cool. Um, Andrew will be sticking around a little bit afterwards, so you can ask him your questions. Uh, I'm going to shove him out of the way real quick. <laughs> uh, first of all, let's just give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So for you guys uh, watching, of course, we're going to have more master classes. Next Monday, we'll be over at the University of Greenwich, where Adam is going to talk about game design. And on Tuesday, uh, Pablo, who right now is behind the camera, you can't see him, he's going to step over here and talk to you guys about teams. Uh, that'll be right here at UCL. So Monday, 6 p.m. Greenwich, and Tuesday, 5 p.m. at UCL. If you are an institution, like an educational institution, and you're interested in partnering with us potentially, shoot us an email at varsity at spaceapegames dot com as well, or if you just want more info about our varsity program, you can do that as well. And uh, I think Nick is going to throw up the schedule there real quick. It's already up. He's done it. Awesome. Um, that's it for us. We will be re-airing the lectures, like I said before, so keep a lookout to our social media because you'll be finding all of those updates over there. And that's it for us for today, but we'll be back next week. So yeah, hope you can join us. <laughs>